from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, the president and the author, Heating and Cooling in the Digital Age, Leo da Vinci plays his 500-year-old hits, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. Alrighty, it's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 248. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us in the chat room at catholicunderground.tv. A special welcome to those of you watching us on YouTube Live on our CUTV live stream. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He is the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. He wears a funny hat and a big cape. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, Kathleen Lee, she's a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge, and she is our local licensed faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Good evening. And we've also got uh, Mary-Kate Taylor, our video director for the live stream. She's there in the pod cave uh, doing the video switching. And, of course, uh, Jeff Blackwell, whom you don't hear, is uh, is on assignment to make sure that that he gets proper um, nasal decloggery. He's sick, so uh, pray for, for Jeff. He's and, in the TARDIS. You can tell people. Okay, he's in the TARDIS. He's he's traveling through uh, relative dimension in time and space. That's, it's. I didn't want to say anything, but that's what it is. So this week we have a a double special fiftieth anniversary on Friday, November twenty seventh, nineteen sixty three. Two great Catholic icons died. Um, of course, Father Ryan, we know that we know one of them because we celebrated the uh, his death day. This past week, the the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The other one may be not so well known. Right, especially not in the United States. The other is C.S. Jack Lewis. Uh, mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis, of course, the inimitable, inimitable English author, orator, and all around salty guy, was one of the the inklings who sat with J.R. Tolkien yeah. and uh, G.K. Chesterton. And uh, of course, to- uh, Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote the Screw Tape Letters. He wrote Mere Christianity and the Four Loves and a pile of books Um, and in fact i've discovered today for the first time he is commemorated in the liturgical calendar of the church of england wow november 26th Hmm. do you know how he's listed i have no idea i didn't even know there was a formal liturgical calendar um that included lay people in in this the cv so i'm i've got to do some more research yeah that's very interesting because i know uh for example uh (laughs) interestingly enough that martin luther is uh is on i believe i don't know if it's the c of e's uh calendar but there is a, a a Protestant calendar out there that includes Martin Luther, and it doesn't say anything about him other than he is listed as a psalmist, you see. Hmm. So I wonder how C.S. Lewis would be listed on the Church of England calendar. That's very interesting. So, yeah, nobody uh, really paid any attention to uh, C.S. Lewis's death because there was something else going on. Right, that was the exact same day, November twenty second, 1963, where our own president, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated as his uh, in Dallas, Texas, as his motorcade passed through Dealey Plaza, and uh, of course, in in the last few the last few days, people have been saying, "Well, where were you?" And of course, I'm one of the ones that has to say I was still a twinkle in mommy's eye yeah. uh, at that time. But uh, but yeah, that was that was a, a a hugely important day, and we're celebrating the 50th anniversary this week. I was actually on the TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we priests, no, you know. <laughs> okay, that's true. Uh, yeah, and and I I I wasn't either. Um, and Kathleen, you weren't either. No. Um, really, nobody in the studio today here is. Uh, but we do have some folks in the chat, no doubt that were. And it really was one of those uh, those seminal moments in in our recent history. Of course, he was the first Catholic president. And um, you know, I read something this week, and I don't know, Father, if there is is import to it or or truth or or whatnot. But supposedly. Um, whenever news traveled to Padre Pio, who really was kind of almost in the height of his ministry in, in the 60s, word traveled to Padre Pio that uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated. And Padre Pio was purported to have said, um, he is already in paradise. Hmm. I, 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 yes, and, and I've been looking and trying to find uh, you know, the, the source for that. And the, the notion is that um, some people, and of course only Padre Pio would have known this, the ability to read souls and, and had that great uh, spiritual ability, um, supposedly uh, people had witnessed the president going into to, to church to go to confession uh, shortly before that, uh, that motorcade trip. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, really interesting thing. I, I, if you, uh, one of our undergrounders, can find me the source for that, I'd be very interested to, to know. 
Um, but of course, uh, you know, President Kennedy, very famous. Uh, C.S. Lewis, kind of famous in a different way. Right. It, you know, C.S. Lewis was uh, this kind of slovenly man. He was not somebody you looked at and said, here's a wise and generous person. He he was called Jack by everybody because his dog died when he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And in an act of loyalty and love for his dog, he took the dog's name. And so for the oh. rest of his life, he went by Jack, even though his name was Clive Staples. Well, of course, if my name were Clive Staples, Kathleen. Yeah. You know, Jack seems a little bit more. Yeah. That's mm. like that's like if your name were, you know, I don't know. Careful. <laughs> Garfield Belligery Booth. Garfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would I would stick with Jack. <laughs> or a cat. Ooh. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, very interesting. So, um so introductory thoughts to this. Um CS Lewis, he's one of the great authors. Right. I mean, in in the English language, CS Lewis, GK Chesterton, uh, will will in years to come, I think, be held up next to people like Shakespeare, not not right. above him, but unquestionably one of the great authors in the English language. His clarity of insight, un, unimaginably brilliant. The screw tape letters, mere Christianity, uh, are are the kind of books that no one should miss out on reading. Yes. Uh, Lewis is a quintessential everyman. He loved his family. Uh, he was just absolutely the 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 salt of the earth kind of guy. Fought in the World War. With a long to alongside Tolkien and, and, and Chesterton. Uh, Kennedy, on the other hand, very different in every way. He was the climax of the closest thing the U.S. has ever had to aristocracy. Right, this is uh, kind of whenever we talk about Camelot. Yeah. Right, I mean, he the Kennedy family were, were the only political dynasty. Um, for Louisianians, it's something along the lines of Edwin Edwards. I mean, the, the Kennedys were the Kennedys. There's not even anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and he had been bred to be what he was for, for generations. He was learned, he was educated, he was bigger than life and bigger than himself. And I think because he died so young, he remains a kind of icon that rises above anyone he was and above any of his real decisions. And he be kind of becomes, you know, this, this archetype for Americans. That's right. In fact, uh, even despite any political leanings or things of the nature or even leanings to the faith, uh, folks almost uh, look at Kennedy the way that they would look at uh, a, a saint, really. Um, they, they see in, in some of his politics and, and his ability to lead, they saw almost little hints of what a president should be and could be. And, uh, and perhaps do you think that we romanticize that a little bit today? I think definitely we romanticize him. I mean, we, we make him out to be uh, someone who, who never had any faults. And, of course, part of that is you don't speak ill of the dead. Right. You know, it was very, very well known that, that JFK had had lots of extramarital affairs, that he— um, you know, had been known as a as a serious drug abuser. Yeah. And yet at the same time, when it came down to it, he made some of the most important decisions, um, you know, that that have been made. I mean, he was responsible for ending the Cuban Missile Crisis. You yes. know, I mean, he he was responsible for setting our nation uh, on a direction of optimism and hope. And of course, he was also responsible for creating the modern, um, mediocre Catholic politician that says you don't actually have to believe in faith. And he was the grandfather, so to speak, of the privatization of religion, where we want to trans transition from freedom yeah. of religion to freedom of worship. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things you could say negatively, but at the same time, Kennedy was was raised in the with the, with the new Jesuits. Yes, you know, he was surrounded uh, by all these these new hyper progressive Jesuits, and he was basically a '50s Catholic who was right. do what the priest said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and and he did what the priest said. And uh, and so I don't think we we ought to put too much blame on him personally. He's right. he's a man who was formed to be who he was, mm -hmm. and he was the first you know Catholic to be a, a president of the United States. So uh, I think he is in a certain sense an icon above himself. That's right, and all the more reason that it's it's very permissible to to think that um, he perhaps recognized his uh, his indiscretions and shortcomings, and and uh, perhaps he did go to confession that day before his assassination. You know you. That's the beautiful thing about about being Catholic is that they're and really Christian <laughs> is that there's always room for mercy, you know, and that's a real that's a real gift I think that that sometimes we in in our ability to kind of judge the public figure which we're called to do we're called to judge morality that's what we do that we sometimes uh, kind of miss the the little the little pinhole by which the Lord can call one uh, to Himself in 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 great mercy. 
Um, and then, of course, you have you have uh, C.S. Lewis, who was a, a member of the Oxford movement, right? And I don't know a whole if our listeners know a whole whole lot about the Oxford movement, but it was kind of a big deal. Well, he he was the the fruit of the Oxford movement. The Oxford movement was a little before his time, yeah. but uh, Oxford movement came about in the the College of or the the University of Oxford, of course, where Lewis, Tolkien were were both dons or professors, yeah. and it was a kind of a belief that the Church of England was not Protestant. Mm -hmm. And that the Church of England was meant to be the Catholic Church, but merely the Catholic Church separated from the direct authority of the Pope, very much the way the Orthodox in the East see themselves as Catholics who are simply not bound by the direct authority uh, of the Pope. And this and was, so, Blessed John Henry Newman was an, uh, was an espouser of this at first. Well, he was, he was the father of the Oxford yeah. And, uh, and and so certainly Lewis is in the tradition of that. And Lewis was very adamant. He said, look, I, I love the Catholic faith. I have nothing against it, but I'm English. <laughs> I'm English. <laughs> and and he said, I could never be Roman Catholic precisely because I'm, I'm English. English. Yeah. Hmm. So he would always have to be an Anglican or an right. Anglo-Catholic. And, and, and right. frankly, his, his, his idea was if we can change the Church of England to make it what it was intended to be. Now, of course, we as Catholics know that would never really work, but— right. You know, that, that was his kind of romantic notion of what he wanted to accomplish. And, in fact, he did a lot of that um, and, and made a, a lot of headway with leadership in the Church of England. And books like Mere Christianity mm -hmm. and The Four Loves, you know, played a huge role in that. Right, exactly. And so in the lives of, of Kennedy and, and C.S. Lewis, we see kind of an ironic twist, don't we? Right. We see that, that Kennedy was, was the Catholic, you know, the iconic Catholic, held up as the public Catholic and at the same, you know, he was not, in fact, particularly Catholic. Yeah. But then we see Lewis, who is held up as not a Catholic, as the icon of Anglicanism, and in a certain sense is perhaps more Catholic than anybody who's ever, you know, drawn breath. <laughs> and so you have this kind of this, this nice juxtaposition that these two then died within hours of each other, even though everything in the world separated them. And so there always will be kind of an eternal connection. Yeah. between these two opposite mismatched people. For those who choose to see the connection. Also, uh, we, we find in the chat room that Aldous Huxley died on that same day. That's right. And uh, there was an excellent book that was put together by Dr. Peter Kreft about, uh, called Between Heaven and Hell, A Dialogue Somewhere Beyond Death with John F. Kennedy, C.S. Lewis, and Aldous Huxley. Oh, my. And it is a worthy read. Oh, well, we'll have to put that in our show notes. Father Ryan, make a note of it. It's already there, man. Oh, well, that's uh, good work. Uh, so, so in terms of legacy... Uh, it says really uh, that that there's epic, priceless legacy here. No, I think there definitely is for both of the men because, as I said, Lewis Lewis's legacy will go on and on. His books, his literature are yeah. spectacular. His insights are, are insights rather are inspired, and his personal story is beautiful. Right. And even though JFK's legacy is more spotted, we do have the very real sense that here is a man who who did something and stood up for, in the, for the faith in a way that no one else has done. And despite his personal failures and despite the fruit of the errors that he, he promulgated, he still stands as an icon and will stand as a, an icon of, of the possibility, hope, and inclusiveness that this nation is built on. That is correct, Father Ryan. You have answered well about the terms of their legacy. And so uh, final thoughts? I well, for me, I think we, we ought to remember what both men stood for and make every effort to do that. But I think more, more than anything, we have to pray for both men. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's, of course, what we always do. We, we may not speak ill of the dead, but we always pray for them, you know, and that's, a, that's an important thing that we can do for their souls. Because even though Padre Pio may have said one thing, um, we continue to pray for, for the souls of those, especially ones whom we saw publicly having perhaps a, a spotted view, you know, um, of, uh, of, of how they, they went about living their faith. And so we continue to do that, and we continue to do this. You're listening to The Catholic Underground. We're online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker, alongside of Kathleen Lee. We've got Mary-Kate Taylor in the pod cave and Father Ryan Humphreys. Uh, our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, most of us know by now that smart thermostats are a thing. Kathleen, did you know about smart thermostats? I did. I really? Love, uh, yeah, I love thermostats. I really Re do. Like, like it's a thing for you. Um, I Yes, because I <laughs> use them frequently because I'm, I'm always hot. And so um, I'm constantly trying to figure out 
trying to get the thermostat to get it right. internally straight mm-hmm. and also the thermostat on the wall. Yes. Mm-hmm. I see. And, and so, uh, Father Ryan, now you and I have been early adopters of the Nest. Right. I bought the Nest about two years ago um, and installed it in, uh, in, in both of the homes I had out in my previous parish. And I have four five actually installed in the current parish I'm serving in. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and Nest and Honeywell are the two big names. And I actually considered moving to Honeywell because of some limitations associated with Nest. Um, but these are the two big names in the internet connected thermostat market. Uh, and both of them are trying to do way, way more than just control their temperature from your phone. You know, that was the first kind of big, big movement forward, but just like Facebook and Google Nest and Honeywell are capturing huge amounts of data about your personal habits. I don't know if you realize that, Father. Well, I, hmm. I, I can only imagine that they must be doing that because I know that whenever you have an internet, con- internet connected anything, um, if it's trying to learn your habits, because that's basically what the Nest does, it knows when you're home, when you're not, and it can adjust and turn on the thermostat and turn it off. Uh, but it's got to be phoning home, I would imagine, right? Well, to some degree, it's phoning home. I mean, it's, but it's, it's connecting lots it. of data. Yeah. But realize that, that these things have chips in them. That were yeah. basically the chips used to power the iPhone 3G, ah. which is something like 60 times more powerful than the CPUs that Alex Lindsay used to render graphics on the Star Wars movies. Wow. So, <laughs> so it's, it's crunching this data all the time, and, right. and I would imagine, as you say, that that data is, is very useful. It, it does. It, it's incredibly useful because it, what it's able to do is know and predict what it is you're going to want at any one moment, yeah. and it's going to be able to know oh, well, he's going to want to do this so I can slowly ramp up the temperature rather than kicking the fans on super high and, you know, draining huge amounts of power. We can slowly ramp or maintain the temperature at different levels, and that saves huge amounts of electricity. Yeah. Um, But it also is able to predict other things about your habits, and eventually, just like that automatic thing you have in your car, is going to be able to start advising you and say, because mine already does this, you know, you, you can handle it being a little colder. You know, have you thought about just saving one degree? You know, and, and I, I like when that little leaf appears on my Nest thermostat and I feel like, look at me. I, I get an award because now I'm, I've got I, like a, a badge because I'm, I'm saving electricity. I'm saving the environment. Uh, Paparaki in the uh, chat room wants to know, and this could be getting you on your soapbox. Can the Internet oh, Control yeah. thermostat respond to a report of global warming? If it were really good. <laughs> I guess if you had enough nests installed in enough homes around the world, maybe we could get enough data together to find out. Well, and the thing is that the, the nest is an entirely internal thermostat. And so, I mean, oh. what they are trying to do is is to create an entire line of devices that really does map what you do. And then that would become useful as part of a campaign to say, okay, we want to improve habits, yeah, and we know what your habits are. And, and that's certainly part of the big equation. Um, but right now, Nest has the thermostat, but they also now have a carbon monoxide slash smoke detector. Oh, I didn't know that. Hmm. Yeah, that's brand new. That hooks into the same network that you can control, and you can it can tell you all sorts of things about the, the air quality in your home. Um, and then that's going to, obviously, that'll lend to other types of devices that will be able to do other types of things, tracking all manner of things about the, the the electrical use of your power outlets and things like that. Very, very cool. And the power is all in the thermostat the, there, the, that, that ability to do all of that. And, and it's strange to think that even probably five years ago, six years ago, how old is the 3G? Uh, the 3G is, what, five years? Five ago? years ago. So, so even 10 years ago, you would have to have a computer hooked up to your thermostat. And now right. your thermostat is the computer. Hardwired to your to your computer. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Kathleen, do you rent your home? I do. I rent an apartment. Are you Are you allowed to make modifications in it? Um, no. <laughs> oh, so you couldn't install? I was going to say because you have Wi Fi at your place. Mm-hmm. Would you yeah. consider installing a, a a thermostat, an internet enabled thermostat? Absolutely. I think I I, I think so because I, we just have ours on. Ours is probably. 20 30 years old oh it's, <laughs> it's one so of the original thermostats you can't even see yeah. where the the um the little dial is oh you just, you just have, have to, to guess, guess. Mm-hmm. oh my goodness yeah. and of course the real plus about the nest thermostat is say say you're in your car mm-hmm. and uh, you are you are quite intemperate you're like oh gosh it's sweltering and in, in mm-hmm. my cajun air conditioning car yeah and uh you want it to be nice and chilly when you get home well you just turn your phone on and you tell it to set yeah the thermostat that's one of the things I love about the Nest is is I can do that, and and just the thought of that is is kind of mind blowing nowadays. 
But it's not just that it's a, a mind-blowing thing that you can do that's a neat trick, but, uh, but there's also a practical win here. Well, right. It also is a big money saver. I yeah. mean, I discovered this when I, when I put in that new house in Campty. Um, I was able to, to track very, very closely the, the difference in cost and expenditure. And, you know, I could tell the thing, look, you know, you can learn when I'll be out of the house. Yeah. And so I'd leave the house and for six, seven hours at a time, the device wouldn't turn on, you know, mm -hmm. and so, but it knew there was a kind of a, a bottom level. I didn't want it to get warmer than this or colder than this. And then I'd, I'd be on my way home and I'd go, oh, I'm going to be home. And I'd get out my device and say set to home yeah, or set to, to home. Yeah. And, and I'd get home and it was perfectly comfortable. And so I'd get the very, very best of all things. And some days in the middle of the summer, my air conditioner was running for three hours total in the entire day. Which, I mean, actually does factor into savings, especially in a parish. Yeah, when you're talking about cutting cutting utility use by a third, yeah. you know, in the middle of the summer, that's a gigantic win. So that might be something useful for you out there uh, if you have uh, Wi-Fi in your home and uh, and maybe you're you're thinking about now I really could could shave a little bit uh, I think on on some uh, some air flow in my house um, the Nest or uh, even the Honeywell I don't know because I don't have a Honeywell uh, one but I know the name sounds weird when I say it so and, I would and go we for ought to Nest. say now that it's it's cold outside and some of our listeners in the chat room are, are very very cold areas yes. when you're laying in your bed in the morning and you don't want to get out, you can reach over, get your phone, and say, heat this place up now. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, <laughs> Before I move. And so you can lay in bed for an extra 10 minutes, and all of a sudden now your place is warm instead of having to get in that incredibly uncomfortable feeling of getting out of the warm bed into the cold air. I like that idea. Uh, J.D. Zondo in the chat room says, if they could combine the Nest and Skynet, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so so that it's way, coming, man. when the aliens take, or rather when the machines take over, Kathleen, you'll be comfortable. Yes, I will. You know? From the Catholic underground. Alrighty, also uh, from the Tech Make Something Old, a little easier desk, which Kathleen staffs about three hours a day. Mm -hmm. We have uh, something called... When I'm called, not snacking. When you're not snacking? <laughs> In the commissary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, from, the, from, from that desk, the Mango Premiere uses foreign movies to teach language. Now, you're a teacher. Yes, I am. And I can only imagine this has kind of piqued your interest. Yes, because I have also tried to um, learn several languages. Oh. I say several. How, how successful would you say you've been? Um, well, I, I can understand Spanish. Uh-huh. I, I can't really. That's about as far as I go. Pero no hablar. No. Okay. No. All right. Um, but anyway, Mango is this program, and it actually has two modes. There's... Uh, the movie mode and the engage mode. Oh. Mm. In movie mode, uh, you just watch whatever film um, you want that they have in their program um, with double subtitles. So, so you've got the English on the top mm -hmm. and then the other language on the bottom. Right. Um, and so your language and whatever language you're learning, which is easy enough. Um, but that lets you hear and see the words and connect them. So there's a yeah. lot of, uh, there's uh, you know, I saw a little video on it. There's some color coding, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. They'll... Use several different colors. Oh, so like when they mention a word mm -hmm. in the language. Well, they'll have they'll have the um, let's say it's one of the languages is Mandarin. Mm -hmm. So let's say the film is in Mandarin. They'll have the subtitles in Mandarin, and each word is a different color, which corresponds with oh the, with, with the Mandarin the texture or yeah the with the English, and so the yeah. the two um, correspond together, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is engage mode, which is no relation to Star Trek. You're welcome for our Trekkie fans out there um allows you to go through scenes slowly and then to click on things you see to hear and see the foreign words for them wow so um it, it has a lot of stuff that goes with it um there's color coding that i talked about um in the engage mode there's also uh, phonetic pop-ups so you can um click over a, a word and it'll tell you how to pronounce it um they have some quizzes there's cultural notes there's grammar notes um, and, and so engage mode is a little bit slower. They'll set up the scene for you, tell you what's going on. Um, now, and do, then, is, are these movies that are already in their library? Yes. From, okay. from, from what I understand, these are, these are movies that are already in their, uh, in their library. And it, the, they're only covering four languages right now, which is English, Spanish, Mandarin, and Japanese. Japanese is the language of the future. Oh. No, maybe it's Mandarin. I don't know. I, which Depends I thought, you know, English and Spanish were pretty... You yeah. know, standard, but sure. Mandarin and Japanese are, are interesting choices. I guess it depends on where you do your banking. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I really, really like this. Why, why haven't we thought of this before, Father Ryan? 
you know, I have no idea. One of the things that I used to do when I was trying to improve my Spanish a bit was I would watch movies I know I've seen on, yes. the, on DVD and use the Spanish language track. Yep. Um, and I've, I've recommended to my school at St. Mary's while DVDs still exist, you know, let's, let's watch The Lion King and The Little Mermaid and let's watch them in Spanish. See, si. You know, so that we can, because the kids know these movies inside and out. And so, you know, let's use, let's use the language track that's there. But I don't know why nobody's really done a good job of it. This is like Mystery Science Theater meets Rosetta Stone. I was just thinking the same thing, that, uh, that this, is, this is right out of a, a Mystery Science Theater uh, show. Because um, I was, uh, for some reason, when Kathleen was, uh, was introducing the story, I was thinking about um, all the Mystery Science Theater movies, those, those C-class movies I've <laughs> seen, and I'm trying to imagine them with uh, with subtitles, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I wasn't thinking of a mainstream <laughs> film, but 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 that's what I was doing. <laughs> this is a really fascinating idea, especially for somebody maybe who is a visual learner, mm-hmm. because I I actually I learn language by hearing, so I would would do well to to have the the just to watch their mouths and yeah. to to listen to the words, but then you've got to be able to connect it with something, and so to have the subtitles I think would be really a, a helpful thing for me. Yeah. And I'm I'm actually really excited. I'm going to have to try this out mm. um, because the the only other thing I used to do, Father Ryan, you would watch uh, movies that you know you've seen in another language. I would get books that I know that I've read and read them side by side. Oh. And see if I can figure out figure out how uh, how to to how the syntax works um uh, but i don't do that too too much anymore you know we don't get too much time for those sorts of things but this seems like something that you could just you could pop up on your computer yeah and in fact um according to the story um many public libraries are, are licensing it yeah that's that was the cool thing as i was looking to say well how can i sign up and it said well you can pay if you want to but uh <laughs> but it, it has a little thing that says put in your zip code and you put it in and sure enough even here in, in natchitoches the public library subscribes to some some service, and so um, it's a little bit of a nightmare once you go to a library, a website for a public library. Yeah, those um, are difficult to but, navigate. But once you find it, you know it's it's free, and so you just go to it and watch the movie and engage in the whole thing through a web portal. Wow, I I really I think that there could be something here. Oh yeah, this is <laughs> and great, it, and it could be good. So I know one of the blessings is this is also. Uh, good for ESL for English as a second language. Yeah. And so if you had someone at, you know, just as a social justice thing, somebody who came up and said, you know, um, I, I'm really trying to learn English. I'm not doing very well with it. Do you have something you can help me with? You say, sure, park it right there. We'll set you up a computer and you just watch a movie. <laughs> park it right there, hombre. We'll load up the public library's website, which may take a little while, but you'll be well on your way. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, Kathleen, you gonna you going to try it? I think I might because, um, you know, I've tried to get into Rosetta Stone, but um, it's slightly expensive. Well, can, can I ask the question while we're on the subject of mm-hmm. Rosetta Stone? Exactly what does it do? Um, Rosetta Stone is... is um, does I mean, it show you pictures? It's a picture, yeah. It's, okay. it's you know, and, and um, yeah, very visual. Okay. I would say something, you know, along the lines of this, except, and now I haven't, you know, I've only seen like the... The uh, promos See, for it, yeah, because I've never used Rosetta Stone, and I've often wondered, is it worth the uh, the investment? But this seems like something that I can get behind that that may very well be free, yeah, based upon what your public library is doing. So yeah. that's uh, mm-hmm. the way Rosetta Stone works. Is it's one of those things where if you really, really need to learn the language, mm-hmm. and you've got some some in- incredible sense of I'm going to do this, it's the finest piece of software out there. Yeah, but it is a serious investment of time. I mean, you know, hundreds of hours. And so if you're just kind of casually saying, I'm going to be going to Mexico and want to know how to order a beer and want to know, you know, how to, how to haggle with somebody at the, at the Mercado, you know, Rosetta Stone is a nightmare. And most people are just not interested in a full, heavy-duty, yeah. committed yeah. study of a language. Yeah, they don't and even so it want... to be massive overkill. Yeah, they don't even want conversational Italian. Right. They just want uh, a commercial Italian. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, it's something though that we will give some credence to, and I'm going to look at. Uh, now, everybody knows about Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Uh, most of us have seen the drawings of the guy with the wings or the guy standing in the circle with the box. You know. Um, well, one Polish musician slash historian slash piano maker has finally assembled a 500 year old Da Vinci, his one and only musical instrument. And and Father, this is is really something. Um, it, it looks like a big harpsichord. Right. And it's, it's something that I honestly have no idea how to even go about describing. I was writing up this blurb before the show, and I'm going, I don't, 
I don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, on the outside, it looks like any regular grand piano, like you said, a harpsichord. On the inside, though, there's a wheel. Yes. And the wheel is wrapped in a horsehair bow, like, like a violinist uses a bow or a cellist would use. Yep. And the wheel spins with a foot pedal. And then when you press the key down, it uses this kind of hook operation to push the string into contact with the bow. And so then when you actually press a string, instead of sounding like ting, 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 like a piano, like a percussion instrument, yes, mm. it sounds like someone is bowing a violin or bowing a cello. Yeah. And, it's, and so it's the weirdest sounding instrument ever. And it's fascinating, especially because it, it, it also has some other, I don't know if it's a different rank or whatever, but it also has some organ sounds with it too. Uh, so it's, it's really, really full sound. It is, and unfortunately, there's not anything that's written for it. And so I've, I've watched a video huh. of this guy playing several, you know, kind of pop, you know, popular pieces with it, but none of them make any sense because, you know, it just sounds like kind of a staccato stringed instrument. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. I'd love to sit down with it and, and play some organ pieces that were written for strings, you know, that had been yeah. adapted to this thing because it seems fascinating. You can play many keys at the same time. You know, it's it's not something, um, you know, where you can only play one string. And so you really could have one person playing the part of four or five cellos. And that, right. that could be very interesting. And it, do you think this would ever see its way into uh, a symphony hall? I think we'd have to find some people who would get really behind it. Yeah. Um, right now, because none of the classic great, great composers composed for it, uh, there's nothing really to do with it. But, I mean, if right. you took something and said, we're not going to make the whole piece about this, but this thing is going to replace part of the string section. It's going to replace the violas or something. Mm -hmm. um, that could be interesting. I don't think it's ever going to be mainstream the way the oboe and the sack butt are, right. uh, but it could certainly carve out its own niche. Kathleen actually was a traveling sack butt minstrel for a summer uh, in, yes. in rural Idaho. Yeah, I mean, not many people know that. A lot of money playing the sack butt in Idaho? The sack butt, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it brought in the skrilla. Oh yeah. No. oh, yeah, it did. Yeah, it sure did. I was uh, rolling in it. So, uh, <laughs> the sack butt or the, uh, or, the, or the money? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, so we actually are going to, to go for the Oscar this year uh, or, or the Emmy of those who have said the word sack butt the most times in, uh, in a program. You think we have a shot? What, about at the sack butt Emmy? Yes, yes, the sack butt. Better mm -hmm. than the oboe. Uh, I I like this mu this musical instrument first of all because it's it's almost like like getting the uh, the DNA from the mosquito in amber. Yeah. I yeah. mean, in a sense, we have resurrected Leonardo da Vinci. Hmm. I, I mean, in a sense, you're you're hearing his voice almost because this is a, a musical instrument. I don't know that. Do, do you think he ever built it? We don't know. No, it's it's it was very clear that he was very clear. He never got around to building it. Wow. He wanted to, but he just never had a chance to get it done. That's amazing to me. And so, in a sense, we, we really have unearthed something that not even, not even the inventor knew what it could do. Hmm. Well, you know what makes it exciting to me is that, is that da Vinci, just in theory, puts this thing together yeah. you know, and says, I wonder. He didn't do it like by experiment. This wasn't Thomas Edison with the 53rd try working out finally. This was, you know, well, what if? And it turns out you build the thing, and with very, very minor modifications, it works perfectly. Yeah. You know, that, that just boggles the mind. Exactly. I, I'm, it's amazing. You, you kind of wonder if some of his flying contraptions would have worked. Well, I think some of them have been tried. Yeah, some of them actually. I think there's one or two in the Air and Space Museum that have been built. Huh. Yeah. I don't know. The dude was, uh, the dude was sharp. He was. It's too bad the show that's been made about him stinks so bad. Oh, well, yeah. what, what can you do? Yeah. yeah I like the watch. fact that in Star Trek Voyager, Kathleen, oh, let's not go there. Uh, uh, John Reese Davies played Leonardo Reece, da Vinci. I love John Reese Davies. He sure did. You're listening to the Catholic Underground. All right, it is the Catholic Underground. I'm Father Chris Decker alongside Kathleen Lee, Father Ryan Humphreys, and Mary Kate Taylor. And, uh, of course, we continue now with a little bit of news from Faith and the Church. Greg McCown is an author, and like many authors, he needs to get away to write. And what makes Greg interesting is his method for getting away. And I like it because, well, I'm Benedictine in my heart. He calls it monk mode. Hmm. And so this is kind of like getting away from it all, isn't it, Father? 
Well, right, in, in, a, in a completely unusual way. Now, let's say what it's not. It's not going off to some random picturesque place. Like uh, a Flemish drink, painting. That's right, to drink coffee and wine and write one page a day, you know, and, and smoke delicious cigars. It's not, it's not running away from responsibility because he's doing this monk mode in his home. You know, yeah. He doesn't go anywhere. Um, and from the blog he writes, uh, Greg says, quote, I decided I would write from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. every day. That's 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. every day, five days a week for nine months. Kind of like half of a monkish day. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. And he worked in a small office in his home, very tiny, he says. But he said, I found in it a space, and that space let me find creative freedom, the hmm. same way a monk might feel about his, um, about his cell. Yeah. You know, the idea that it is, you know, this is a place where I find freedom in the, the structure. And so it's a real focused, hard work kind of day. And the part he said that he loves was he's a father. Yeah. And so he was able to end, a, end at 1 o'clock every day. He was done. And then he would be able to go and spend time with his family and his friends. And so what he did was rigorously impose order, structure, and discipline on his life, but not run away from the responsibilities of his life. Wow. And uh, one of the best lines in the post is when he asks himself, quote, is it for everyone? And he answers, quote, to be anything like this extreme seems totally unrealistic for most people today. But really, that seems like an evidence of the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, it's kind of, it reminds me of, uh, of Timothy Ferris's books. You know, there's, I think, the, the four-hour work week and the four-hour body. And, and essentially, Tim Ferris just goes crazy, uh, almost on the OCD, of, of using his, his body as an experiment um, to, to get things done faster and to get things done um, in, in a more expedient fashion. And it sounds like, in a sense, what, uh, what Greg is doing here is, is that he's regimenting his life so that he can actually be free. And, and that's the real, the real beautiful thing, is that whenever we place constraints upon ourselves for the, the sake of building virtue, and I guess we could, we could even say that creative, uh, creative, the ability to create is, is virtuous uh, in so much as the creation is done properly, um, then, then he actually is, is, uh, is entering into the spirit of what monasticism is. That's right. This, this, the seeking, the search for perfection, yeah. you know, is, is what we, in a certain sense, it's not what everyone's called to do. Yeah. Um, certainly not in that kind of radical way, but I mean, you know, this is, this is very good. It's beautiful. That's right. And, and so, I mean, Kathleen, as a person who, who you work from what, seven in the morning mm -hmm. until what, two thirty. Mm -hmm. Um, Around three, 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 thir three forty-five. If you have a, mm -hmm. a, st a faculty meeting or yeah. something like that, um, would this be something that that maybe? Because I, I don't know. You like to write music. Yeah, you know, and I find that 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 space is important. In fact, when yeah. I was writing um, my thesis for undergrad, um, I went to our friend Roberto's house in Canada. Yeah, and he has like <laughs> was like three or four stories. And he has a little monastery. Where is I was, what he's got yeah, for you. where I was staying, he calls it the Lee Suite, but it's the <laughs> very top, um, almost like the attic. And uh, it is the attic. It and I was able to to be in that space, and it was a completely new space. Yes, you know, still but, is. But I was, I was, well, new to me. Mm -hmm. But I was able to make that space a place where I could think, you know, literally, be segregated from everybody. Yeah. Um. And and just think and write and. And did you do that from certain times during the day, like say from nine in the morning until one? I'll I'll do this. You know, I, I didn't at the time because mm -hmm. I was kind of just you know we were I was visiting so yeah. Um, but I've done that before with with writing music, for sure. Just that yeah. finding that space and that time and making it, you know, a routine. Yeah, and and I'll speak a, as an artist as well. I'm afraid of doing this. Because I know it will work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm afraid of the structure. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, the, the, for an artist, the, the first thing you think of is, well, I can't be constrained in order to practice my art. But, um, but monks have been doing it for hundreds of yeah. years. Um, and, and if you've ever been to a monastery that does anything and does it well, from the liturgy to baking bread, um, it's because there has been so much painstaking um, order that has been brought to it, and that's what makes it good and what makes it better and what brings perfection to it. And, of course, what happens is as the monk perfects his craft, his soul is also being perfected too. Uh, so, I don't know. Father Ryan, this is a good idea, huh? I think it's a beautiful idea. You know, I mean, I, one of the things that, that bothers me, especially now that I'm the pastor of a, of a school, 
is I see how much we uh, we use personality profiles and yeah. um, you know and and psychology as a crutch. You know, right. one of our our teachers the other day, you know, wanted to ask our our third graders uh, to do a test on the rosary, and so she gave them a word bank of all the twenty mysteries of the rosary, and then asked them to fill it in. And boy, everybody had a panic. Mm -hmm. So that's too hard. That's much, much too hard. Uh, the kids will never be able to do that. And uh, she gave the test anyway. And surely enough, almost everybody, you know, got an A. Yeah. Um, and and it's it, it was one of those eye-opening moments where we really, if we expect nothing, yeah. we'll get nothing. But if we really do expect more from ourselves, you know, if I expect myself to get up at 4.30 every morning and exercise or get up at 4.30 every morning and pray, yeah. then it's not undoable. I've just got to be willing to commit myself to do it. That's right. And and so there we go. Uh, there There is a great deal that the monks can teach us, even the ones who are cloistered, in, uh, in being able to, to kind of monk out huh, and go into monk mode. Uh, I, I may have to I may have to do that because I've got I've got a little work to do on uh, on a certain web comic. So 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 we'll see. Now, mm. I want to get through these. So we're going to do it anyway. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, I, Laura McAllister, who is an Australian Catholic and she's an aspiring countess <laughs> over at the Catholic Cravings blog. Sounds like Kathleen uh, has identified <laughs> seven types of Catholic nerds. And so I thought maybe we'd see if she's pegged any of us here at the Catholic Underground. Um, the list we'll put in the show notes, but but we'll go through them really quick. The first one is the Apologeta Techie. That is a Catholic nerd who is convinced that he can convert the entire world via Twitter. Um, I, I don't even know if I would even try to do that. I know those people. I'm not one of those. <laughs> you're, you're not one of those people. Um, and the other thing about the apologetic techie is fond of the term new evangelization and will use this term to explain all of their behavior. On Facebook, new evangelization. Instagram, new evangelization. Played Candy Crush Saga till 3 a.m., new evangelization. Yeah. And uh, and uh, one of my favorite things that she says is posts things on Google Plus because Jesus told us to minister to the least of these. <laughs> Burn. Um, the, the the second one is biblio brain. This of course would be the Bible loving nerd loves languages and is the folks that are the folks that keep the, the they collect Bibles and uh, you know side by side compare them all day long. I have a friend who does this, collects all different translations. Wow. And, uh, and, and yeah, just reads them side by side. Number three, which could be Kathleen, <laughs> converty pants. <laughs> a recent Catholic convert and nerd who feels the overwhelming need to tell everyone their life story and how amazing, but also how hard their conversion has been. Mm. The, the artist, uh, or rather the, uh, the author herself, uh, talks about herself as being uh, a converty pants. She's, she's very excited. Um, bizarrely fond of puns, so any book by Scott Hahn, because well, yeah. he he love it a pun, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, usually goes to social media to to share their enthusiasm, and yeah. um, as such, commonly they're mistaken for apologetic techies, but they don't have a whole lot of a uh, lot more knowledge necessarily. The converty pants, they just they just want you to be where they are. Um, the the fourth one is the <laughs> dominiac, that is a Catholic nerd who is also a Dominican, typically third order secular. Um, scholars believe that the Dominiac is the most powerful of Catholic nerds, mainly because most scholars are Dominicans anyway. Father, would you would you bring contention to that? Not even a little bit. No, <laughs> it's a. They're also fond of beer, hounds, and the color white. Um, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> you think you have an idea of a question? A demo, uh, not a demoniac. A, a dominiac <laughs> will sell. Will tell you to not Google it. Suma it. You see. That's it. Oh. Yeah. That's classy. Um, number five, to which I fall, and Father Ryan probably fall, uh, the liturgy yep. geek. That's the Catholic nerd preoccupied with the liturgy, uh, often seen holding an original 1638 edition of the Graduale Simplex Holtius Totius Romanum Tomatoe for low pontifical compline of the Ides of March. Unabridged. Unabridged. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't really exist, Kathleen. Thank you. Okay, just making sure. All right. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so yeah. This is where our Father Ryan and I probably fall. That's if I had to peg slightly us. less absurd than my pick of the week. That's true. Which which you'll get in just a, a minute or two. And then of course there's the Theo nerd. This this is probably Kathleen, huh? The most generic of all nerds, but uh, of all Catholic nerds, but taking theological nerdiness to deeply discomforting levels. <laughs> has a pet named Anathema. If you don't know why, then you're not a Theo nerd. We can't really continue this conversation. But uh, mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah, so I Theoner, think I'm the last one. You you think you're the absolute last one, Ooh. the tobsessive, yeah. <laughs> the Catholic nerd who is obsessed with the uh, theology of the body, which is um, a relatively new subspecies of of Catholic nerddom, says the authoress, emerging only with the pontificate of John Paul uh, John Paul II, their homeboy, uh, she says, James weirdly James. fond of acronyms like NFP, Ugh. things like that. Yeah, notable for their peculiar tics, uh, a tendency to shout the words self gift, openness to life. Things like that, marital embrace, complimentarity at every possible moment. Do you do that, Kathleen? I do, I do yell at my girls. I go, I, I yell at them, T O B, T O B, and they're yeah, like, oh. There you go. Um, their patron is Saint Edith Stein, or blessed soon to be Saint John Paul II. Uh, to obsessives, of course, need a male and female patron saint because obviously complimentarity. You see, yeah. This is a very <laughs> smartly written article. This is um, funny. Yeah. So, Father Ryan, you're part liturgy geek and part theo nerd. Yeah, I I might just be all liturgy geek. Wait, I'm loving this, this with the little biblio. This meme for the um, tob obsessive. It says yeah. she says I saw you at daily mass. Let's get married and have twenty babies. That's right. It's kind of this <laughs> obsessive looking. Uh, it uh, is young and yeah. We'll we'll put that we'll put that in the show notes uh, so that you can see those as well. Um, would you add any definitions? I feel like there you, you you she's missed the recent convert who is still trying to fit Catholicism into the categories. And uh-huh. the language from their previous religion, yeah, because they still want Pastor Bob to be right about some things, like a, a Denama dweeb or something. Oh, there you go. Um, oh, and good. I also think that there's the John Reeves, the obsessive saint lover, oh, who yeah. can't wait to share the insights of Saint Seraphim of Sarov or Saint Medard or somebody. That's right. That no one's ever heard of, mm. but they just read a book by them. That's right, and they have the best saint ever, and they deserve to have their own huge icons huge erected icon. somewhere in 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 a public space. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But uh, but I, I do know this. There could be an all of the above. In fact, they're wondering that in the chat room. Um, is is that uh, is that there could be an all of the above for some of us? So so there you go. Um, that is maybe where you fit into. Um, maybe that's why you listen to the Catholic Underground, or maybe it's just for this. The CU Pick of the Week. All righty, for our first CU Pick of the Week, I think maybe we'll go to Kathleen. Kathleen. <laughs> I'm most of the times first on these, but yeah. Um, well, my pick of the week this week is the Pure Faith app. Um, you can find it on iTunes for a ninety nine cents. And uh, Pure Faith actually um, began as a prayer book for teens, written by Jason Everett, who is a chastity speaker. That's right. It was actually a book. It's actually a book. Yeah. And you know, um, I had the book, and it's yep. awesome. Um, would you say this is it's for high school age or? You know, the book is really not. It, it's I not mean, geared towards any not, particular audience. It, they say it's for teens, but you know, there's a lot. There's some stuff in there like, you know, prayer before a test and things like that. But yeah. um, but the app uh, just came out recently within the past couple weeks, and it includes your your typical things like daily readings, liturgy of the hours, um, prayers to the saints and and Mary, um, prayers for confession and and mass before the blessed sacrament. Um, it includes the Divine Mercy and Stations of the Cross, but there are two things. You know, I have a couple. We all have yeah. a couple of, of pretty cool Catholic apps, but two things that I see um, that it has that I haven't really found anywhere else um, are, you know, I just found the intentions of our Holy Father. Oh, that's you can press neat. on that, and I'll tell you what um, they are for the, the intentions month. are for the month. And so mm-hmm. this month is for suffering priests. Hey. Just in case you need to know. And it also has a really cool place where you can journal. Ooh. Yeah, so you can keep your own prayer journal within the app, and so I really, like. huh? So, so Kathleen, do you think that maybe the the prayer journal is being sent general delivery to Jason Everett to read? Hmm. Like a thermostat. Like a nest. Yeah. I yeah. doubt it. Oh, yeah, probably not. It's, it's probably only ninety nine cents. So <laughs> <laughs> they didn't spend that much on on a phone home thing. Yeah, yeah. but you know, I, I find that it's a it's an app for everybody. Even though Pure Faith was for um for teens, I think this one is. I, I like the idea because, uh, you know, oftentimes, Father Ryan, I know we have like three or four different apps that we use regularly mm-hmm. to do what we do. Although maybe you've whittled it down to one, but I doubt it. Um, I like the idea of, of having kind of an app where, yeah. especially if I'm a teen, yeah, uh, with a, with an iPod touch or something like that, where I can just kind of have one thing where all the Catholic devotionals are yeah. that I go to. And Jason Everett is, is a great 
person to. He's good. He's kind of in the vein of theology yeah. of the body, right? Yeah. He, he's he, a, a kind of he's a been disciple. He's a speaker for a long time. Yeah, he's a a kind of a disciple time. of John Paul II and yeah. uh, and and Christopher West's uh, some of his original ideas mm-hmm. about theology of the body. Um, yeah. So 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 good stuff. Um, Father Ryan Humphreys has a Latin pick of the week. The book is called the Canticum Clericorum Romanum. Yeah. It is a hyper specific book that solves one very Ooh. very big problem. That is. When you're saying the old mass, um, if you were not taught how to sing things properly mm-hmm. based on looking at the text, there's nowhere to go to find out. Um, they're, they're, it's very, very difficult for someone to say, oh, sure, just go sing this, uh, this lesson you know, from the Old Testament or just go sing this gospel. Um, there's not anybody who's done a good job of making that doable. Until and today. So th- until now. Uh, the book, the Canticum Clericorum Romanum, puts all the prayers, the orations, the epistles, and the gospels that you need for all the old mass, for the old, the high mass and the sung mass into a book that can physically be opened, and then you can sing it. All the chant is there. Everything is there. It's there in the festival tone, the solemn tone, everything. Wow. It is wonderful. So, and, so uh, explain but, to me what normally you would, you would have to do before this book. Would you have to just kind of make up the tone yourself? Well, you would have to memorize the various tones yeah. um, that were appropriate, which are kind of uh, reciting tones and things like that. And then you would have to look at it and determine based on commas, periods, semicolons, et cetera, uh, what you were supposed to do. And that wouldn't be abnormal in, in the days of yore when that was something just built into your head. But yeah. as people who went to seminary, when we did, yeah. we got none of that instruction. Not and, even in and, English. No, and so... This actually has been helpful for me because it's helping my singing in English mm-hmm. as much as it's helping my singing in Latin. And, uh, and so we're starting our traditional Latin Mass next weekend here at Immaculate Natchitoches. And so this book has been a, a gigantic help for myself wow. and for the deacon. So is, this a, is the traditional Latin Mass uh, that, that you're beginning there in, in Natchitoches, is that's gonna, is that going to be a regular thing now? It's going to be every Sunday as a sung Mass, and then one Sunday we're going to do a solemn high every month. Oh, my goodness. Well, I might come and sit in choir if I can manage. Well, it'll be at 5 o'clock on Sunday evening, Vespers at 4.30. Bring the kids. Oh, I have no kids, but I might go anyway. Hot Uh, dogs for my mom. That's right. Free balloons, Kathleen. Yay. Free balloons. All right. uh, My pick of the week is a book that I ran across. I was on vacation last week, and um, I love, well, I can't say I love because that's a strong word, but I really like independent bookstores. And I didn't realize there's like this whole cadre of independent booksellers. They're, they're even developing their own merchandise that only independent bookstores have. But uh, inside the, the Wind City bookstore, there, uh, there was a book called How to Steal Like an Artist. Hmm. And of course, naturally, being an artist, hmm. I said, well, and now, a thief. I wonder what it's all about. Well, you know, it's what, what do they say, uh, Father Ryan? I, I'm trying to remember the exact uh, wording is that... Um, Good artists borrow, but only great artists steal. Right. And the notion is that there's nothing new under the sun and that everything is kind of a variation on a theme. Even even musicians w- would say that, too, is that a lot of the, the inspiration for some of the music that you write comes from music that you heard. And uh, and so the, the notion is you don't need to be a genius to make art, whatever that art is. You just need to be yourself. And uh, and uh, Austin Cleon, who is the the young writer and artist who knows that creativity is everywhere, and creativity is actually for everybody. Um, it is it is a self described manifesto of the digital age. Uh, so it's it's got a really positive message. It's got a very graphic look. It's got illustrations and exercises and examples that put readers in touch with their artistic side. And the notion is you don't have to do something new; just do something good. And, and create. And in the act of creation, um, you'll see what your influences are. And it's okay to be influenced by certain artists and things of that nature. And you actually can perhaps create something that's, that's beautiful, even though it's not 110% original. And, um, and I really like that idea too, because even if I think about the webcomic that I do, it's joecatholic.com, um, it's not 100% original to itself. It, it borrows upon the Catholic tradition. It borrows upon um, Universal uh, Comics's um, shortcuts. It, uh, it borrows upon Indiana Jones, a little bit of Johnny Quest, you know, and so all of these things kind of mix together and make a new presentation of something. But that's not stealing in the sense that, that, it's, that it's wrong, 
but it's kind of making a greater work out of a composite. And this book really just gives the permission to do that. So how to steal like an artist. Uh, we'll put that link in the show notes there too. Father Ryan, you might actually enjoy reading this book. Yeah. I mean, not to one up you, but I was thinking about some of the books I'm enjoying. Like um, I, I've, the Hunger Games movies have not been very impressive to me. Mm -hmm. um, but since I started reading the Divergent series, oh, yeah. um, and I finished that, I'm extremely excited about the Divergent movie um, precisely because, you know, it is, it's a book that, that very, very clearly steals from the same stuff the Hunger Games stole from. Yeah. But it's at the same time, it's, it's fascinating and it's a different take and it's only slightly different, mm -hmm. but you know, I love that. I love the fact that somebody says, oh, this is great. Uh, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different point of view. And I mean, the book, the novel I've been writing now for several years is, you know, I, I no, no joke at all. I've stole part of it from Les Miserables. I've stole part of it from other things because I have, I have some ideas that came together and I want to communicate something. And I don't want to be remembered as a great artist. I just feel like I need to tell the story. And so that's what I'm doing. And uh, I love that. I think it's great. It's actually basically just like Les Mis, except all the characters are ponies. My little pony. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to give it away, Father. But uh, well, you know, it's it's called Yellow Things, and apparently there's a yellow pony or something. I don't know. That's right. I remember when you came up with that title. Mm -hmm. I've been working on it for years and years. Yeah, now, but well, kind of like Joe Catholic. <laughs> it'll be it'll be my my opus. Yeah, and and mine may not even be a finished opus, but it'll be whatever it is. Because yeah. I'll just make sure. Comic for Father Chris Decker. That's right. And maybe Leonardo da Vinci's uh, ghost will finish it a little bit later. You know, da Vinci's ghost. <laughs> the, Mozart's ghost. That is Mozart's ghost. Uh, if you can tell us where that comes from, you get a cookie. Uh, all right, uh, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. We, as always, thank all of you who are, are in any way benefactors of the Catholic Underground. For those of you who pray for us, for those of you who actually uh, donate. And so as we come to the end of the year, we just invite you to maybe go back and, and look at, uh, at your credentials there and update your information uh, on, on, uh, on our website. Um, you can go over and, and check that out, and you can really check out everything that we do at catholicunderground.com. We always thank you for your support, even if it's prayer, especially if it's prayer, because uh, that is exactly what we need from you. And you help us in so many other ways. If you want the show notes that accompany this episode and the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate, if you want to find out ways to connect with us on Twitter or on Facebook, if you want to do any of those things, you can head over to catholicunderground.com because catholicunderground.com is really where everything uh, takes place. Now, one of the cool things that we want to tell you about, if you haven't seen it already, is we have begun our 24-hour, seven-day-a-week live stream over on YouTube Live. And so if you happen to miss this episode, you can actually come back later in the week and you can watch our live stream as it's happening um, from, from our previous episodes, which we're very, very excited about. So uh, that's at catholicunderground.tv. All righty, Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at Fr Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It's been my distinct pleasure. All righty, we've got uh, we've got Kathleen Lee. She is the faith ninja over at uh, at Kathleen Y A B R on Twitter. Thanks, yeah. Kathleen. Anytime. Mary Kate Taylor is an evangelist and in her spare time. She campaigns against people who wear socks with sandals. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for more from the CU. Thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the digital continent. It's Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gun Digital, and I promise you, we will see you next time.